Nope. 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 Okay. I was I'm on call today, so I got an ICM, so I had to like go out and try to help them resolve the issue. Hopefully, I don't get another one. Because step in, he just is busy after This is the day the Lord hath made. We shall rejoice and be glad in it. I'd like to welcome you to our Easter service here at Redeemer Redmond. I'm Jim Gibbons. I'm one of the elders here at Redeemer, and it's super, super blessed to have you join us today. We've got a uh, lot of activities today. We've got an Easter egg hunt and a brunch following the service. And so we're just so glad that our guests are here uh, that may uh, have not been with us. Welcome all of our friends online, our family online that are joining us. Uh, happy Easter. I'm going to have you stand with me now for the call to worship. The Lord is risen. He has risen indeed. The Lord is risen. He has risen indeed. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O oh, death, is your victory? Where, O oh, death, is your sting? Hallelujah, Jesus is the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in him will never die. Amen. Let's sing together. Christ the Lord is risen today. Hallelujah. Sons of men and angels say, Hallelujah. Raise your joy. Sing ye heaven. 
Let's pray together. God of Abraham, God of Isaac, God of Jacob, living God of us, we honor and adore you as we celebrate with joy the resurrection of your son, Jesus. Thank you for providing a way out for lost mankind and showing us incomprehensible love, sacrificing your own son in our place to take the wrath we deserved and giving us in return his righteousness and peace with you. King Jesus, we thank you for taking on human form, suffering on the cross and rising to complete the work on our behalf, defeating sin and death. While leaving earth, you did not leave us alone, but left a helper, the Holy Spirit, to be within us, to establish your kingdom and to sanctify us. So, Sovereign, triune Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we praise you. You are not dead, you are alive indeed. And we have this hope through you, our risen Lord and Savior. Hallelujah and amen. <clears throat> so I don't know if you've ever been given bad news and then found out it wasn't bad news, that it was actually good news. And if you, if you remembered the feeling that you had when it went from bad news to good news. So think for a minute, if you will, Mary, when she approaches the, the tomb of Jesus, so depressed and grieving and weeping and sorrow for the loss of the Savior. And she sees what she thinks is a gardener. And she sees the tomb is empty and she asks the gardener, have you seen him? And the gardener says, Mary. And she knew it was, it was her Savior, Jesus. He sees her at that moment from bad news to good news. The Bible tells us that all mankind falls under the curse of sin. Romans 3.23 says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Sin simply meets not meeting God's holy standard or his law. What's the good news? Well, Paul goes on to say that the wages or payment for this sin is death. 
Romans 6.23 says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. A theologian, R.C. Sproul, used to say, Mankind generally winks at sin. We need to see the seriousness of our sin, and we need a remedy for that sin. That remedy is Jesus, the substitute who pays the just wage due our sin with his very life. Jesus bled his bread for you, brothers and sisters. He bled blood, a brutal death, complete separation from God, so that you can have true peace with God, not just today, but for eternity. Yes, sin is very serious indeed. The death we deserved. We need a change of heart. So this part of our service uh, is now sort of that cognitive dissonance moment. That's a psychological term that says we are not living up to God's holy standard, and we know it. Now is the time we confess that and we realize that we have a remedy. That remedy is Jesus. So if you would, kneel with me now or remain seated. And I apologize, I was supposed to have you seated. (laughs) But as we confess our sin, uh, please recite this together with me. We have sinned against you. The wages of our sin is death. Death is our last enemy. Before death, we are powerless. Our lives are but a breath and a mist. We cry out to you to save us, to rescue us from this body of death. We have no other hope apart from our Savior, Jesus Christ, who died for our sins, was buried, and rose on the third day. Jesus, forgive us for our sins. Swallow up death in victory. Raise our bodies from the grave and grant us eternal and imperishable life. All this we pray, Jesus, by the power and the glory of your name. Please continue to confess your sins to God, and if you do not yet know Jesus as Lord, would you consider this passage further in Romans 10:9? If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Brothers and sisters, rise with me as he rose for you and receive these words of grace. Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law, but thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Well, let's sing together. We're going to sing a couple old hymns and uh, a couple newer songs uh, about the resurrection of Jesus. All hail the power of Jesus' name. All hail the power of Jesus' name. Let angels prostrate fall.
Standing on the promises of Christ my King Through eternal ages let his praises ring Glory in the highest I will shout and sing Standing on the promises of God Standing, standing Standing on the promises of God Standing, standing, standing on the promises of God. Standing on the promises I cannot fail. When the howling storms of doubt and fear assail, by the living word of God I shall prevail. Standing on the promises of God standing 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 on the promises of God my Savior standing 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 on the promises of God standing on the promises I now can see perfect cleansing cleansing in the blood for me standing in the liberty when Christ makes free standing on the promises of God standing 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 on the promises of God my Savior standing of God. One more time. Standing, standing, standing on the promises of God, my Savior. Standing, standing, standing on the promises of God. Standing on the promises of God. Standing on the promises of God. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me I once was lost but now I'm found was blind but now I see was grace was grace that taught my heart to fear and grace my fears relieve how precious did that grace appear the hour i first believed my chains are gone Chains are gone. My 
My chains, my chains are gone, I've been set free, my God, my Savior has ransomed me, and like a flood, His mercy reigns, unending love. shall soon dissolve like snow the sun forbid to shine but God who called me here below will be forever mine will be stand here this morning thankful for the reality of you who have conquered death and that the chains have been been broken Lord and we can stand here free in you we thank you for that reality let's sing the doxology together praise God from whom all blessings flow praise him Greet your neighbor with that uh, passionate Easter greeting.
Okay. Hey, I want to welcome you um, again to our Easter service. Go ahead and be seated. And um, kids, I want to ask the kids, anyone, you know, who can walk who's below, like, say, 12 or 10 years of age? Come on up, kids. Come on up. And sit up here. Come on up, young people. Yeah, come on up. I realize that it's going to be a very long sermon. You can sit on the floor if you want or on those chairs. Oh, good to see you. Um, And I want to tell you a story to help you something to think about during my sermon because the story illustrates the resurrection of Jesus. So back when we lived in a big city called Indianapolis and had a big house with three floors plus a basement, My oldest son was about 12, and he lived up in our attic. It was like a turret room that looked out over the street, a really nice big room. He had his bedroom up there, and he had a pet hamster named Furball. (laughs) And he loved Furball very much, and uh, and Furball had a cage, and he slept in uh, in the bedroom with Jacob. Well, one Sunday afternoon, Jacob and I were watching uh, the Indianapolis Colts. That's a football team on TV, play football. And the Colts lost, and Jacob was very angry. And for whatever reason, he forgot to close the cage door. (laughs) And um, he was, anyway, and lo and behold, Furball escaped. And he was nowhere to be found. And we searched. Now, that third floor had different rooms, some crawl hole spaces. And we looked everywhere, but we couldn't find Furball anywhere. And we thought, oh, no, he's going to escape maybe outside and get eaten by a coyote. Or he's going to die in the wall. Where We just don't know. But we were so worried. But we thought, we'll, we'll keep the door of his cage open. And we'll put food and water there. And uh, Jacob also put a newspaper down, so at night if Furball snuck in, he would be able to hear him. And sometimes we thought maybe the food was going down, but we never heard Furball. And a couple weeks went by, and I had lost all hope, and I think we all thought Furball was dead. But we didn't, you know, we didn't know for sure. Well, anyway, on Easter Sunday morning, this is a true story. I'm not making this up. <laughs> Easter Sunday morning, Jacob heard rustling. He thought it was in the wall. He thought it was in the wall. He thought maybe that's furball in the wall or underneath the floorboards. And so he came running downstairs. Dad, dad, mom, come on. And he called us up. And we went upstairs. And there was a a bookshelf. And I thought, well, I'm going to move the bookshelf so we can see the wall and maybe find a hole and find furball. So I lifted up, I lifted the bookshelf up, and lo and behold, whose face do you think came out from underneath that bookshelf? It was, there was Furball. He had a little nest that he had carved in the carpet, a little kind of, he had a nice little soft place. There was some Lego toys, like a Lego ball, (laughs) some M&Ms, some wrappers. I mean, it was really quite, and I can't tell you how much joy we felt that this little hamster was alive. Well, we, I guess he was always alive, but <laughs> that is a little bit of a picture of how much joy that the followers of Jesus who thought he was dead when they came to the tomb and his body wasn't there, and then later they saw him, that he was really alive. Just imagine how much joy. So we, could, we just had to tell everyone the story. We were so happy to share about furball being alive. And that's how the early disciples were about Jesus. He is alive. So when you hear my sermon today and you hear me talk on and on about the resurrection, imagine how much joy you would be if you had discovered your own pet that was alive, that you thought was dead. Okay, you need to get a pet then, okay. That, anyway, thank you guys. Have a, have a, I hope you can make it through my sermon. All right, here we go. Good, good. Today is your birthday? Oh, that's so sweet. Oh, that's so great. Maybe at brunch we'll sing for you. Oh. Okay, well, we are, um, we're going to be finishing up this uh, scripture that we've been looking at for a couple weeks. 
in uh, the letter that Paul wrote to the Corinthian church, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. If you would go ahead and please uh, stand and uh, for the reading of God's word. <clears throat> I tell you this, brothers, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we shall be changed. For this perishable body must put on the imperishable, and this mortal body must put on immortality. When the perishable puts on the imperishable, and the mortal puts on immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O oh, death, where is your victory? O oh, death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. This is the word of the Lord. Man, go ahead and be seated. Well, we've been looking at the doctrinal bones that we hold to as Christians, and, and we believe certain things, and those things can be thought of like bones. They give structure to your body. We believe in the resurrection of the body, which is the end of the Apostles' Creed, and the life everlasting. And today we're going to see that those two things go to, together, the resurrection of the body and the everlasting life that we have through Jesus Christ. And what, how would this change your life if you believed it? If this became the message that resonated in your heart when you woke up in the morning and went to bed at night, you actually believed that Jesus Christ rose from the dead. How would it change your life? Or how does it change your life? And to work a little bit backwards, we're gonna start with... Um, the bad news, right? Because the, the context of this scripture um, begins like this. Death makes everything vain. Death makes everything vain. That's the first point I want to make because Paul says at the end of this passage, knowing that in the Lord, your labor is not in vain. So his conclusion of this great scripture about the resurrection is your work isn't vain, it's not in vain. That's the conclusion. Now, what's Paul's train of thought? We, if we follow his train of thought um, through other scriptures, uh, and really, what does the Bible say? It goes like this. First of all, God made the world and the body good for life with him. The body, this world, is made for life with God. And isn't everything that you and I love in this world connected to the physical you know, like the pinks and the greens and the yellows of spring. And the sound of the birds singing in the morning when I walked here. That's the physical, right? Um, the laughter of a friend, the cry of a seagull, the taste of salt on your mouth. Those are physical things. And the resurrection and this, the, the hope of the resurrection has to do with the physical, right? So last night at dinner... We were invited over to some friends' home in Kirkland, and they have a home that looks out over the lake, Lake Washington, and they're all of the senses, right? The smells of the chicken, the, uh, the, the laughter and the conversation with friends. Um, it was just a really sweet night, full of the physical joys of life in this world. And then they said, hey, we want to show you something. Um, and they said, come on downstairs with us. We walked downstairs and go to their garage. And uh, they showed us their 2020 hardtop Corvette convertible CR. Now, some of you know, I, I don't really know what that means, except I love convertibles. But others of you would know, wow, that's a really cool car. And it, it's a sweet car because just walking into that we were just ooing and aahing. Then we're, they're like, oh, we got to show you how the top opens. So they turned it on, and you're just like, oh, my goodness. And uh, it was just this really 
really fun time to talk and laugh and be together and see their very cool muscle car. But what I'm talking about now is I'm talking about this good physical world that God has put us in. God made the world and the body good and for life with him. The next, uh, I guess you could say, point in the train of thought of Paul is that sin and death destroys life and makes everything in vain. In a scripture, just a little bit before this, he said, if, if it's true that there's no resurrection, if there is no resurrection of the body, well, go ahead and eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. Death takes strips everyone from you. And so what's the point? Just try to seize as much pleasure as you can in this life. There's an ancient king named Solomon who is wise and wealthy and very powerful, and his conclusion went like this. I have seen everything that is done under the sun, and behold, all is vanity and a striving after the wind. He had acquired great wisdom, he said, is vanity. He had enjoyed pleasure of food and wine and women, and he said, it's all vanity. He had done great works and deeds and culture building, and he said, it's all vanity. He had vast possessions and wealth, hard work and toil, and everything he said, it's just vanity, it's chasing after the wind. Johnny Cash puts it this way, everyone I know goes away in the end. Why am I working so hard? Why am I loving people so much? Death is going to rob me of everything. And, and so death makes everything vain. And one more point I, I need to make. This is all sort of helping establish the good news of the gospel. The, the bad news is that a disembodied eternal life is no salvation. It's just not. You want to be an idea floating around or you know, some kind of an intellect, a, a soul or a ghost or a spirit without a body, really? That's the best you can do with salvation? When everything that we know and love and appreciate and value in this world is physical, the smells and touches and laughters, and it all has to do with physical touch, the good things that God has made in this world. So a disembodied life, Paul says, is no salvation at all. The body matters. And so what you and I have to think through as we come to uh, this good news about the resurrection is what are we gonna do with our mortality, being mortal? There was a physician named Atul Gawande who has written a book called Being Mortal. It's a really thoughtful and provoking book, and basically he makes the case that the whole uh, medical institution really doesn't know how to deal with death. It's all about helping you, healing you, fixing you, but the prospect of death, helping people you know, approach it and families and all of this, we're just really bad at it. And he goes into, in chapter two, things fall apart, um, sort of a history of how people die. And so just for your pleasure, I'm gonna uh, lay that out for you. Said, <laughs> he said, uh, in most of history, it went like this. You, know, you were living your life, you were kind of puttering along pretty well with your health and life, and then all of a sudden, like the trap door opened up and boom, you got sick and you died, usually around 30 or 40 years of age. Life expectancy was very short. And then he said, due to medical progress, it became more like a hilly, you know, going down a, a mountainous hill where you're like, okay, you know, or a hilly mountain, I don't know. You're going up and down. It's like, oh, that's bad. Oh, I'm better. Oh, that's bad. You know, and it kind of stretched out life a little bit longer. But he said, death occurs later. But the same the trajectory remains the same. And then he says, now it's more like this. Um, where it's long, you see how that's stretched out. Oh, it's long and kind of uneventful. He says, large numbers of us get to live out a full lifespan and die of old age. No single disease leads to the end. The culprit is just the accumulated crumbling of one's bodily systems. And by the way, he describes some of that. And it's terrible. I'm just like, I don't want to read this. This is just <laughs> depressing. Uh, but the accumulated crumbling of one's bodily systems while medicine carries out its maintenance measures and patch jobs, the curve of life becomes a long, slow fade. Okay, that is, that is the question before us. Is what are we going to do with our mortality? And into this darkness and the tyranny of death, you have a people you have a people 
you see Paul, you see this little church in Corinth by AD 350, about half of the Roman Empire is sneering at death. Death, where is your sting? Bring it on. Is that the best you got? It's, it's really quite amazing. You have a people group that thinks something very different about death than people had ever thought before. They're no longer afraid of death. What has happened? What has happened? And this is what has happened. This is my second point. And this, again, is kind of background to what Paul is uh, going to be talking about. Because, yes, I'm, I am going to get to life eternal. But it, it all hinges on this second point. This is the good news that Jesus' death reverses, or Jesus' uh, resurrection reverses death. And the good news, Paul says, goes like this. I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you in which you received, in which you stand, and by which you are being saved. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, or Peter, then to the 12, then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time. So then he goes on to talk about some of the details about the resurrection of Christ. And one of the things he says is, think of the resurrection like the first fruits. The harvest has come. Here's the first fruits of the harvest. The full harvest is coming later. Another way he talks about it is that Jesus will return and put all of his enemies, including death, under his feet, and he will then deliver the kingdom to God. This is what we talked about on Good Friday, Christus Victor. Like he's coming back, he will put death under his feet, and he will reign, right? And another thing that Paul says is that in Jesus, all those who believe in him and trust him as Savior inherit his victory and citizenship in the kingdom of God. And I want to tell you a little bit about one of our congregation members, Harry Howe, who um, I think one or two weeks ago became an American citizen. And so that's great. We're happy for him. And, um, and um, so I reached out to him because I, I thought it would be interesting to think about what, what, what is it like to transfer your citizenship, right? Because all of us are born as sons and daughters of Adam into the reign of death into this being mortal, and, uh, and yet Paul says, you are inheritors of the kingdom of God, the kingdom of life through Jesus Christ. And here's what Harry said. He said, hopefully, becoming citizens of heaven is not as slow and frustrating <laughs> and full of bureaucracy. <laughs> he said, it took me 12 years to get citizenship. There are many hoops to jump through to prove I'm worthy to be working in America. But clearly, Microsoft will not have hired me or would not have hired me if they could find enough qualified workers locally because they need to pay me more to help me relocate here. Sometimes I feel like it's easier for illegal immigrants to get citizenship. Now, there's a lot there, but I think the point is this. You know, if you think about it, um, you have to earn your way, show that you're worthy, you know, go jump through the hoops, right? And, and yet, what happens through Jesus Christ by faith as a gift of God is, yes, it is so much easier and so much uh, more free and seamless. Now, does this matter and how would it matter? How would it matter? Well, it matters, Jesus' uh, resurrection matters when you get a diagnosis like uh, cancer. There's one of my uh, favorite pastors who passed away this last year, Tim Keller, when he was diagnosed with thyroid cancer, he said he went back to the resurrection of Jesus. And he began to read a book by N.T. Wright called The Resurrection of the Son of God. And basically he said, if the resurrection happened, it changes everything. It changed everything for the world and for me. And he says this, every Easter I say to my secular friends who love life in this world, even if you can't believe in the resurrection, shouldn't you want it to be true? Because for all of us, the stakes are high. Tim didn't die of thyroid cancer. He ended up dying on May 19th, 2023 of pancreatic cancer, okay? In his 70s, right? 
the stakes are high for all of us. We all have to deal with what do we think about being mortal? How, how do we think about death? And is there any hope beyond being mortal? And this, again, is where the Christians say, yes. There is actually real hope, substantial, tangible hope. And this brings me now to eternal life. What do we as Christians think about life everlasting? My third point is that Jesus wins us life everlasting. It's not something that we earn or or bring about on our own. What Paul describes here of eternal life is based in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now, I'm not going to really be able to describe what the kingdom of God, what that eternal life is like, because I'm not there yet. And, you know, it's, it's, there's, it's shrouded a little bit in mystery. But here's what Paul says. He says, in the reign of death, your body is perishable. I can describe that. Under the tyranny and reign of death, I have a perishable body. I'm slowly and surely falling apart. In the kingdom of God, you have an imperishable body. In the reign of death, I have a mortal body. I am being mortal. Under Christ, I have an immortal body. It's not an idea. I'm not an idea. I'm not a soul. I'm not a ghost. I'm not, you know, somehow disembodied existence in some kind of happy, happy place full of buzzing light. You know, I don't know what, what people who don't believe in, in the bodily resurrection think heaven would be like, but Paul says very clearly, you have a body. It's imperishable and it's immortal. Let me read that to you uh, because it's hard to describe it much beyond what Paul says. I tell you this, brothers, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. You're not going to get into the kingdom of God with your earthly, dying, decaying, sinful, uh, broken, uh, pain-wracked bodies. It just doesn't, you can't inherit the kingdom of God that way, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Behold, I tell you a mystery. It is shrouded. It's a mystery. Yes, we shall not all sleep. We're not all going to be dead when this happens, but we shall all be changed. There is a change coming in a moment, not in a long bureaucratic process, not paying a lot of your dues, but in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable and uh, we shall be changed. For this perishable body must put on the imperishable, and this mortal body must put on immortality. When the perishable puts on the imperishable, and the mortal puts on immortality, then shall come to pass the same that is written. Death is swallowed up in victory. Sorry, I can't tell you more about heaven. That's the best I can do at this time, but I believe this. I actually believe that Jesus' resurrection that happened so many years ago gives me the ground and the basis and the foundation for believing that God will raise this mortal body and give me some kind of a spiritual body that will go on living uh, before God. Now, what kind of person should this make you? How should we be? Who should we be in this world? So Jenny was recently telling me that um, she's been reading the Bible, but backwards. I have a group of friends, and uh, we're reading through the Bible. Most of us are reading it the normal way. <laughs> you start in Genesis. You kind of work through the Old Testament. You, you know, God makes the world good. Then there's the fall. Then there's all the Israel and all the promises of, of a Savior. And then Jesus shows up and life and death and resurrection. And then you get to, you know, here's the Holy Spirit as a gift of God and the church and this new community and this new life that we have by the power of the Spirit. And then you get to the apocalyptic, you know, end of all things and God's restoration of all things and heaven descending down on this earth and this everything being made new and the tears being white. The very last, you know, these beautiful chapters, Revelation 21 and 22, about the renewal and rest, restoration of all things and this hope, and the joys in the community that we have, right? That's the end of the story. 
and she started at the wrong end. She, that's where she started. She's reading Revelation as the very first book she reads, and now she's like, now I'm finishing up, reading through the Bible. I have Deuteronomy, and she's even saying it backwards. I mean, it's just all messed up, but to her credit, I will give her this. It's actually sometimes nice to know the end of the story. It, what kind of person would you be to know that this life, where, oh, death is your sting, where, oh, death is your victory, when death you know, takes that person away from me and where death takes my life from me, can I laugh at the days to come? Can I face it with courage? Can I be a person that's, well, as Paul puts it, therefore, my beloved brothers and sisters, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. My being a mom, right? Be, try, trying to be a faithful mom and wipe these diapers and hold my kids and work through the, teach them how to work through conflict. That's not in vain. And my going into uh, the office or working from home and all the hours and time I'm putting in, that's not wasted. It's not all in vain. And, and my wealth and the giving of my wealth and the service and opening up my home and the meals that I share with people, the hospitality I give, that's not in vain. Death, you are a door, you're an entrance into life. It is not in vain. You see what happens? The Christian goes from just this undiscovered world where, that we don't know and death and the vagueness and the darkness and the fear of, of that world, as Hamlet says, you know, who knows and no one wants to know. It's just scary, the unknown. And, and for the Christian, death is but an entrance into life. It is but the entrance into the hope that we have. And that's what makes us steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. St. Ignatius of Antioch, I, I, one of my favorite quotes of all time, he was heading to his martyrdom. That means he was going to be put to death for his faith. He was unflinching. He wouldn't reject and renounce his Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And he wrote to, I think it was a church in Ephesus, he wrote this, stand firm as a hammered anvil. Just be a hammered anvil. Good athletes are battered, but still they win. I'm going to my death, but I'm gonna stand firm as a hammered anvil. I'm gonna be battered, but I'm gonna win. What gives a person like Ignatius or like Tim Keller, who uh, months before he died, wrote out his, uh, his funeral service? By the way, I, just, I watched it the other day. I thought it was rather lackluster. I was like, is that the best you could do? Like, I would have chosen... <laughs> I would have done it differently. I, I have other ideas, but okay, this is you, and I get it. We're different people. God made us different, right? And, you know, he's a much greater uh, pastor and preacher and minister than I am, but I would have done things different. But nevertheless, he planned out his service and chose five hymns, and each of them have an intro to them. So people are like reading the intros to the hymn, as Tim, at his funeral, is explaining how people, how the song, the cadence, or, you know, how, uh, why he's chosen this hymn at this time. But one of the hymns he chose was, uh, was this. Jesus lives, and so shall I. And I just want to, that Tim isn't special. He's not special. People sing these, these hymns and songs um, at Christian funerals. This is kind of rank and file. This is just bread and butter of the Christian faith. I mean, we sing these kinds of songs at funerals because they matter to us and we believe them. And this is one of the songs that he chose. I just want you to consider this as I close my sermon. Jesus lives and so shall I. Death, thy sting is gone forever. He who deigned for me to die lives the bands of death to sever. He shall raise me with the just. Jesus is my hope and trust. Jesus lives and reigns supreme and his kingdom still remaining. I shall also be with him ever living, ever reigning. God has promised, be it must. Jesus is my hope and trust. Jesus lives and death is now, but my entrance into glory Courage then, my soul, for thou hast a crown of life before thee. Thou shalt find thy hopes were just. 
Jesus is a Christian's trust. Let's pray. Lord Jesus Christ, we thank you that beginning here in this passage, the early church in Corinth and really now around the globe says these words on this day, death, where is your sting? We sneer at death. We mock at death. We have a different ending to the story, not a disembodied, some kind of ethereal, soulish, ghost-like existence to look forward to in some happy place, but we actually have the resurrection of the body. And we have the new heavens and the new earth, not a spiritual existence, but a physical place made new and good and beautiful by your grace. We thank you for the hope that we have. We thank you that we can look into death, the death of our loved ones with hope and courage because of this. And we pray that this day we would remember and be encouraged and strengthened by our faith in the living one, Jesus Christ, who death could not hold, who is risen for our salvation. We give him thanks and praise and pray all of this in his name. Amen. There is power in his name For the stone was rolled away Mountains bow down before Jesus Christ our risen Lord Jesus Christ, our risen Lord. Let's all stand and sing that again. There is power. There is power in his name. For the stone was rolled away. Mountains by The power of his name, death you overcame once and for all. The grave could not contain the power of his name, death you overcame once and 
once and for all. The grave could not contain the power of his name. Death, you overcame once and for all. The grave could not contain the power of his name. Death, you overcame once and for all. become citizens of the kingdom of God, not by money or, or work or anything you do, but by faith, receiving a gift. And uh, there's a prayer that I'm going to read, and you can pray uh, with me out loud or in your heart. I often say, being, becoming a Christian is a lot like trying on clothes. You try it on. What, what would it sound like if I said these words? What if I actually believe them? So it's not like bad for you to say them. Even if you don't believe them, it's just a way for you to practice, try on what Christian faith is. So I'm going to lead us in this prayer belief as we come to communion. Um, Lord Jesus, I have sinned against the holy God and justly deserve the penalty of death. But I believe that you died for my sins, were buried and raised to life by the power of God for my salvation. Please forgive my sins and give me the gift of your spirit so that I will live the rest of my life for your glory and the good of others and raise my body from that dead that I may share in your everlasting life with all your people. Amen. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the hope that we have um, life eternal through the death of Jesus Christ. As we come to this table set by him, for all that trust in him and believe in him, we thank you for the symbolism of the bread broken for us and the blood or the wine poured out for us, his life given for us. We don't pay a thing, he pays it all. We thank you that we are inheritors of the kingdom of God of life, that we have this great hope to look forward to. And we pray that knowing the end, we could live with courage, firmness, immovable, irrevocable joy laughter, humility, kindness, compassion, empathy, pursuit of others, rich life of friendship, enjoying the gifts that you've given us in this world of food and drink and friendships and family and laughter, walking on the beach and enjoying this good creation, not as an, the end, but as really a picture of what will someday be so much more greater. And so we thank you for these gifts. Help us to live fully in our life in this world with faith in our Lord Jesus Christ who raised from the dead for our salvation. And in his name we pray, amen. Go ahead and be seated. <clears throat> the night in which the Lord Jesus Christ was betrayed, he took the bread and broke it and said, this is my body broken for you. Take and eat. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, Christ took the cup and said, this cup is a new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for the forgiveness of your sins. Drink from it, all of you. Encourage you, if you'd like, to come forward and uh, take of the bread. There is grape juice in the uh, pink, um, pink uh, cups. Wine in the pink, whoops. And grape juice in the clear. Yeah, that's right. Oh, boy. Uh, <laughs> There's gluten-free wafers here, and if you're not in a place of faith, that's okay. Um, like we said, we have people with us every week who don't yet believe. You can just come forward and cross your arms, and I'll say a prayer for you, or just remain seated. Uh, but I invite you to come forward and receive of the grace of Jesus Christ. Yeah.
Eternal, imperishable life was not cheap. It was purchased for you. Let's partake together. <coughs> I think I have a few quick announcements. <coughs> I'm really excited about an upcoming retreat in June for the men. Um, I ha I'm going to hand out these during our brunch, but one of my closest friends in Indianapolis who um, came from a different culture than me. Uh, I went to seminary. He, went, he, he said he went to the federal university is what he called it, um, the federal prison. <laughs> um, but we, we forged a really strong friendship. He, um, I don't think he would consider himself a Christian, but um, in many ways, anyway, we have a, we have a close friendship. We're going to uh, do a retreat together about forging friendships across divides. There's a lot of things that, especially this summer, that we're going to be divided politically as a nation. Race often divides people. Economics, there's a lot of divides over, you know, who has money, who has, who has not. Um, culture, uh, there's just so many different ways we can be divided, especially as men from each other. But this retreat is going to be how do you forge friendships that... Um, even if you don't share, say, the same religion as each other, but you actually can have a friendship where you build trust and relationships. So that, I'm excited about that. So that is something you're going to see and be encouraged to be a part of. Or if you know someone, especially if you have someone you'd like to invite and say, hey, I, I would like to grow my friendship with you. Come and be a part of this. So there's that. We're, uh, I think next Saturday, we're going to go on an outdoor uh, adventure to the tulip fields. If you've never seen the glorious uh, tulip fields in the Skagit Valley, we had so much fun last year. I took them to this really wonderful uh, lunch spot called the uh, Conway Tavern. That's just a really yummy place to eat. We'll just have a, another really fun time um, up at the Skagit Valley tulip fields. That's next Saturday. And there's other things coming up as well. So, uh, by the way... We, um, I guess we're going to have that announcement here in a second. Dismiss, um, are you here? Yeah, let's do it now, and then we'll do our last hymn instead of trying to do it later. All right, good to see everyone out here. So after the service, we're going to um, 
have an Easter egg hunt, and we're going to have a potluck. And so it'll require, so if you're doing the Easter egg hunt, if you have kids, or if you're volunteering, hopefully you know what to do already if you're volunteering. But if you are participating in it, you can meet Linda at the back of the room. Raise your hand, Linda. She's right here. She'll be in the, in the back corner over here. So, so you guys can all go back there. And then we will need, if you've ever been involved in tear up and set and tear down, and you're not doing anything else, we could use your help to tear everything, um, or, well not, or to put everything away in the van. And, um, and then Jason Laxdahl wanted me to let you know that he'll do all the cords and just everything else. I have the key for the van, we can do that. And then everyone else, um, we will take the chairs and move them to the side and then we need some men so that if you're, especially if you're a single man or if you don't have anything else and don't know what to do, but you're just a big body, we have a bunch of tables <laughs> out here that we, we have 10 tables that we need to bring and set up. We're gonna open this door in the, the wall where the kids are, we're gonna move that to the side. And so, and then we're gonna set up tables and then, and then anyone who is able can help put chairs back around the tables. And then Jenny is gonna put um, tablecloths on each table and so, if you have that skill to put tablecloths and flowers, you can help decorate that, that the could table. Be a, that could be a dude. So, so yeah, yeah that. as I say, if you have those that skills, I'm just saying, if you have those skills, I don't. So, um, <laughs> I mean, I, I will do it if I have to, but um, someone usually comes and corrects it after. And so, um, did I miss anything? Is that, okay. Okay. Not everything. All right. Kids, come on up and help lead us in one last hymn to Christ. Let's hey, sing. And this last hymn is not really a hymn. It's an old country song by a guy hey, named Hank so Williams. We so we're going to go old school, school okay? Oh. Hank Williams. Let's all stand together. Well, I'd wandered so aimless, my life filled with sin. I would let my dear Savior in. Then Jesus came like a stranger in the night. Praise the Lord, I saw the light. I saw the light. I saw the light. No more darkness, no more night. Now I'm so happy, no sorrows inside. Just like a blind man, I'd wandered along. Worries and fears I claim for my own. Then like a blind man, God gave me back my sight. Praise the Lord, I saw the light. I saw the light. I saw the light. No more darkness, no more night. Now I'm so happy, no sorrows inside. Praise the Lord, I saw the light. Praise the Lord, I saw the light. Okay, the, the very last part of our service is the benediction, which is a way of God saying goodbye and sending us out for the week. So. Uh, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face smile upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face to you all and give you peace. Amen.